Hello and welcome everyone to another talk in our Google Authors series. Today we have a special speaker, Guy Spear. He's going to talk about his book, The Education of a Value Investor. Uh, I know at least a couple of people in this audience who read this book in one night. And, <laughs> you know, unlike most memoirs where the person who's writing is the hero, uh, this, this is a strange book. This is a book where the person who's writing is highlighting his shortcomings and putting a magnifying glass to amplify the good points in other people that, you know, he's come across in his journey of investing in life. And there's much more than just investing in the book. And for those of us who met uh, with Guy over lunch uh, shortly before this talk, it was just a privilege and honor to share his company. He's a very lively, very enthusiastic person, and I'm sure you're going to sort of get the same sense of candor in the talk. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Guy Spear. Thank you, everyone. Um, I should tell you that uh, I've, I've done TV appearances for this book. I'm much more nervous to come and speak to you <laughs> than I am to speak on any television. And I had the hardest time putting this. I put some slides together, and I had the hardest time doing it, partly because I've never, ever given a talk to what is primarily. I mean, I met some guys from finance that does exist, but I've never given a talk to engineers. And I feel like, especially on the Google campus, uh, you, I feel, know a lot more than I do about the world. In fact, I'd like to sit down and interview you but I guess that's not how it goes. I need to talk about me. <laughs> but um, so I'm really pleased to be here. I would also tell you that uh, if you would have taken me eight years ago and told, asked me if I would believe that some of the things that happened in my life happened, I would have been quite surprised. And I, I was after success in my life, uh, but I, I didn't really know how to go about it. And I feel like over the last few years, partly by stumbling across some things and staying with them, partly through a tremendous uh, sort of very difficult beginning to my career where I worked at a terrible place, you will see, I started figuring out, and I, I don't know, I'm with a bunch of scientists and engineers, and I studied sciences at high school, but I feel like I started figuring out sort of the ways in which the universe works, maybe the laws of attraction. And I'm just blown away that I'm standing here. And you know, Sarah meets me at the airport yesterday, and he's so excited to meet me, and he's sort of treating me like I'm some kind of special person. I'm thinking, I'm just like you. I know as little as you do. So with that, so I have, I'm going to talk. I'm going to try and keep it to under half an hour. I'm just going to blast through some things, just to give those of you who haven't read the book a sense of who I am and what I want to talk about and what I think I can talk about, and then we can try and make it interactive. So what do we have here? You know, I really think I don't understand. Well, I do understand. And it's got nothing to do with all the things that I thought success had to do with. And so uh, I, I really am blown away that I'm here because I feel like I'm quite normal. But uh, or I'm, I'm like everyone else. I'm not, I'm not special in any way. Um, but I, and I never thought that I could write a book. And there are some incredible things that ha came together for me to write a book. I'm not a natural author, and I'm not a great writer. But that was the guy that I wanted. I didn't, when I graduated business school, uh, I, didn't, I would never have said, if any one of you would have asked me, uh, what do you want to be? I would have given you some mumbo jumbo about I want to sort of get into the capital markets and I find it really interesting to be at the nexus between where savings meets investment and it's really <laughs> fascinating and maybe fund some companies. But basically, I had an image of this guy and I see that now. I didn't see that then. I had an image of this Gordon Gecko guy in my head and I kind of fancied that lifestyle. I wanted to be a master of the universe. I'd read about people like George Soros and I thought that was pretty cool. And I wanted to be rich. I wanted to control companies. I wanted to control people. And I had an educational um, experience that I think that many of us have had, that I, I know how to take exams. I'm quite good at studying. If you put me under pressure, I do well. And so I just kind of blasted through my education. And I just thought the world owed me a living. And don't ask me how. Well, I guess you can ask me, because I'm here for you to ask me. But so. I graduate business school, 
And I end up working at a place, so I don't know, I'm sure some of us have seen this movie. So the firm that this was modeled after is called Stratton Oakmont. And the firm that I worked at, where the large part of it has been shut down, is called, or was called, D.H. Blair. And there were people who came from Stratton Oakmont to D.H. Blair and vice versa. So I was an investment banker looking for deals. And I watched that movie, and I thought, wow, that is, that is really, it's exaggerated but accurate. So they take, it, they take exactly the same things that were happening at the firm that I worked at, and they turned uh, the volume up. And you know, I ask myself today why on earth I went to work there. But then even having gone to work there, I spent uh, 18 months there. And uh, so within um, 18 months of graduating from Harvard Business School with this great education, and I was unemployable because once I left that place, and I did finally leave that place, um, people either said, uh, either this guy uh, is willing to play uh, close to the line, the way people from Stratton Oakmont and D.H. Blair did play, or he's just stupid. Either way, we don't want to hire him. And, and I also, when I, when I go back and look at it, and I see uh, people like this guy, Mark Martoma, who's just been given nine years in prison, and you know, I would like to say, and I think many people would say, oh, no, well, I'm completely different to him. But, and I'd like to stand here in front of you and say, oh, I was complete. I think that there's a lot of me in him. There's a lot of him in me. I was a greedy guy willing to make compromises. And some, uh, uh, the head of the firm, two years prior, had promised me the opportunity to make a lot of money very fast. And I went for it. And I was in a place where, in order to make a lot of money very fast, I would have to push the boundaries. That's the way it was set up. Mark Martoma, the same thing. He was put in a position where in order to make a lot of money, he would push the boundaries. The senior people at his firm, just as the senior people at my firm, knew exactly what situation they'd put me in. And I actually, to this day, I think that if I had not discovered this savior, Warren Buffett, who I started reading about while I was working at this firm, I don't know exactly what would have happened to me. And it's kind of scary to think about. It. And I see Mark Martoma, and I think maybe I would have gone in that direction. And it also bothers me terribly to know that um, I'm really well educated. I studied moral philosophy. You know, I, 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 like did, I, I was at Oxford. I had all these philosophers around. We, that's what we do. We study right and wrong. And how is it possible that I'm then finding myself in a place that is morally compromised and uh, I don't actually get the hell out of there, or I don't blow the whistle, I don't do something. I think that's a really important question for American society, global cap capitalism, to answer. I don't think it's been fully answered. I think that there are people like me, the version of me 20 years ago, who will always go back. We're, there will always be young guys who want to get rich fast. And so the Mark Martomas or the sort of rogue traders will always exist. And so. You know, what, what do you do about that? Well, one thing you can do is write about it. Try and write about it honestly. And then maybe you generate a debate. And maybe, maybe the world sees a few things differently. But so I was at an absolute low. And there I am, uh, a um, you know, highly educated guy. And I couldn't, find the, I couldn't find a job out of there. And so th something happens to me, which is absolutely wonderful. I discover Anthony Robbins. So I don't know who's been to an Antony Robbins seminar, but the amazing thing is that I was so arrogant, and uh, I thought that I knew everything, and that everything to learn was to be learned from Harvard Business School and from Oxford and similar places, that I didn't believe that a guy like Anthony Robbins could teach me anything. But at around that time, I came and did an Anthony Robbins seminar, actually not far away from here. It was somewhere in the Bay Area. And it kind of opened me up to a whole new way of looking at the world, and again, uh, and I sort of think that I started figuring out rules for how to improve my life from that point. And then fast forward 10 years, I got some modicum of success. And people start misattributing it. They start saying, oh, yeah, you, have, you, 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 you went to this elite education, or you're very smart, or you have the right friends, or uh, you, you, you have, there's a family business that invested with you. And I felt like they were misattributing any success that I had to the wrong things. And I found myself time and time telling people, no, it's not like that. 
there are other things that happen. There are other things that actually, there's, it sort of sounds strange to say, it, there's a technology of success, there's a to technology of going about uh, uh, succeeding in life that I didn't, I learned it because I had this terrible fall straight out of uh, business school. And so, um, so that if there's three ideas that I'd love for you to take away from this talk, I'll feel like I've achieved something. So, you know, you thought you were coming to hear a talk about investing. Uh, you know, we, everybody understands compound interest, and the key thing is, and, uh, you know, humans evolved to be hunter-gatherers. That's how our brains are wired. The whole bunch of things we don't do very well. We don't evaluate probabilities very well, and we cannot conceive of compound interest. We cannot conceive of something uh, sort of gradually increasing, and then, then, then the, the, the linear slope of that keeps going up. We just think in terms of linear slopes. And I feel like once I understood that, I saw that all the time. So, you know, there's this idea that compound interest is the, um, uh, is, is the eighth miracle of, uh, is, is the eighth uh, wonder of the world. And it's quite extraordinary that if you just compound, and you can do the numbers, I, I show them to my investors every year, if you just compound at any rate, of uh, uh, at, for a long period of time, the, the amounts get very, very large very, very quickly. But the point that I want to put to you is that you can compound goodwill over time. And so, uh, you know, as part of my journey, I started in, uh, so I ended up starting to invest and I fell in love with Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Anything Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, I'd consume it. Uh, Charlie Munger gave a talk where he talks about um, the 24 standard causes of human misjudgment. Anybody who hasn't listened to that talk, believe me, it's better time spent listening to that talk than listening to me. It's really an amazing set of 24 things that once I heard it, I started seeing those patterns again and again. So uh, Cialdini talks in, the book, talks in his book, uh, The Psychology of Human Misjudgment, about the power of uh, reciprocation. And he talks about these uh, Hare Krishna people in airports where they're kind of handing out flowers. They're giving out free flowers. And you say, well, why are you giving me a free flower? They say, it's just a gift from us. 10 yards later, there's a place where you can make a donation. And it's just incredibly effective. So I started conducting my own version of that. And I started just, and you know, it's partly born out of desperation because you know, the standard routes to career success were now closed to me, I was handing out gifts to the doorman, uh, the person I met in the street. I was writing thank you notes to people. And I just, I was determined because he describes also in the book the salesman who was the most successful car salesman who sold, uh, I don't know how many cars in a year, but he, he sent out thousands of notes that basically said, I like you. And if you, so all of my friends are looking at that and they're saying, that's ridiculous. That's not a strategy for success in life. I mean, you look, what, what is that going to get you? And it wasn't going to get me anything short term. And, but I just, I'm slightly crazy in that way. And when something grabs me, I just do it. I, sometimes, if it fascinates me, I do it with a great intensity. So I set myself the goal of, I think it was five notes, three notes a day, five days a week and just kept sending out notes and sending out notes and sending out notes. And if I sum up the number of pieces of direct mail that I've sent out to the planet, it's, it's, it's more than 10,000. It's probably more than 20 or 30,000 over the last eight or nine years. But I just think that so much of what is good has happened in my life, including meeting some key people, is the direct result of just compounding uh, human goodwill. Simple as that. So um, just to take that third idea, and, and you know, I'm, I'm excited to talk to a group of engineers about this, is so um, you know, I don't know if anybody's played around in bathtubs, but take uh, a rubber duck or something in a bathtub. And you know, if you start making some waves in the bathtub, and if you start figuring out, even with a, just a rubber duck, if you start figuring out the, the resonant frequency of the bathtub, even with a relatively small, not a very um, strong impetus, you can eventually get the whole bathtub moving in that kind of uh, sort of in one single wave. And 
I can't explain this and I can't give you scientific backup, but I think that every single person uh, or many of the people that I see have achieved success in life is what they've actually done is that they found a way to interface to the world in a, in a frequency. And I don't know what that frequency means, but it's a frequency that resonates. And once you start feeling that resonation happen, um, things reinforce themselves and crazy things happen like Sarab calls out out of the blue and says, do you want to come and give a talk at Google, which just blows me away. Or uh, in the book, some people who came out of, the, out of the woodworks to help me to, I'm not a great writer, I finished in December with a so-so manuscript. And then a friend came out of the woodworks who helped me to turn it into a really good uh, manuscript. So that idea of sort of like finding what is the frequency with which I can resonate in the world that the world resonates back for me is a really fluffy idea, but I found it really powerful. And if we just go back to this idea of authenticity, so there was a certain period in New York, I call it my New York, the, my New York vortex, where I was trying to be a big swinging appendage hedge fund manager. And I was trying to resonate with the, with the world in that way. And I'm a smart enough guy that I could do a pretty good job of it. And so the world started resonating back. And uh, in a certain way, I, I got money into my fund. I got all sorts of, some good things were happening, but um, it didn't reflect who I was on the inside. And so I couldn't really be authentic about it. And I think that the people who achieve extraordinary things in the world are the people who manage to get the world resonating on the outside uh, and they also, that's the same sort of resonance on the inside. And you have that amazing statement by um, Mahatma Gandhi, be the change that you want to see in the world. And it's just amazing to see, I mean, he had that. So that what he felt, the whole nation of India was focused on what he felt about violence, for example. And he'd go on a hunger strike. And so, and people like that can become extraordinarily effective. So, uh, and it's just an interesting idea. And I, I bring it up later that, so, Whenever I was not succeeding in the world, what I eventually found out was that if I sort of looked inside myself and looked to reorder or to do work inside myself, kind of the outside world took care of itself. So uh, I hope I get that across. And I don't have a watch because basically at around 30 minutes, I am just going to stop. So you know that I'm not an engineer. Um, but how, yeah, but I, I want to I make it interactive. So. Uh, and I, so I kind of want to, like, at the half hour, you just got to shut me off because I could. And I just think it's more fun to be interactive. So, and I, I had a hard time putting this talk together as well because I, I could either tell a life story, but I didn't just want to tell a life story. And I think all of these things um, feed into each other. So, uh, this, so the inner journey idea, or I'm an investor. I was talking to some of the people at lunch. Uh, the, the idea of optimizing something is not just an engineering idea or, a, or an idea from physics. It's, it's an idea that's sort of, it's just deeply elegant to us. The idea, you know, I, I, was, I was thinking, oh my God, I'm going to be meeting with engineers. I was trying out some of the maths that I learned 30 years ago. So the biggest, one of the things that I regret the most about not continuing on a science track is I just remember the, the first day, about 14 years old, we studied calculus. And I, and I had this idea of sort of like at the limit, at the limit, the slope of this curve becomes dot, 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 dx, dy, I remember. And, and I was just like, this is kind of um, uh, magical to me. So, um, but the real world is not like that. The real world is not like that because it's unbelievably complex. There's complexity that's taking place that we just can't model. There's, there's discontinuities that take place. There's, you know, there's crashes in the market. There's avalanches. There's, there's all sorts of things that we just cannot uh, predict how they will go. I sort of learned more about the way economics works by stumbling across uh, this idea of complexity. So I, I, this was, I think, um, it was actually an investor. Bill Miller started off on the uh, complexity idea. But then the way I identified it with the most was this, uh, these um, ants. So uh, there's, a, there's a great book by Holdobler and Wilson, Journey to the Ants, where 
it just comes down to these ants optimizing some pretty complex things using a very, very simple set of rules with distributed agents. And I realize that thinking of the world as like a rainforest or a sort of like ant colonies optimizing whatever it is that they're optimizing is a better way to think of things. Then, you know, so that's the outside. Then if we go to the inside of ourselves, it's just a fiction to say that we're rational. We, we're rational in very, very limited circumstances. It's a very good assumption to make. But there is so much evidence. I mean, Dan Ariely's book, predictably rationally, we know that we're not rational. So I think that there's this strange thing that happened. And again, it's kind of a tool that I feel is a tool for success, that the minute I recognize my own weaknesses, and I'm honest and open and upfront about them, I can start doing something about it. So I think I'm a better investor because I just accept up front that I'm not rational. I have to deal with it. And then I can do workarounds. I can figure out what I'm going to do to, uh, to, to make it better. And worth adding to that is that, um, you know, so how many times has any of us, or how many times have I, because I'm the guy who's speaking, I can't project it onto you, I guess, you know, sort of like, oh, I'd rather have Steven Spielberg's life. But, you know, we're not. I'm in my life. I can't have uh, Steel, Steven Spielberg's life. But um, uh, so everything's path dependent. And that's all against optimization. We're just not in a situation where we're not with the, with the gas. We're, we're not in a closed container. The things are constantly developing. So I think I'm a stronger and better person to say that I'm not rational. I think teams work better when we're up front about what we're not good at. And I don't know how it works at Google, but I've had a, I used to have a hard time with it. I'm better with a small team that I work and being up front about the things that I'm not good at and having them be up front about the things that they're not good at. So, uh, you know, <laughs> it's pretty obvious, isn't it? But I spent, so I discovered Warren Buffett. I also discovered something incredibly powerful, which um, uh, Anthony Robbins calls um, matching and mirroring. So I'm sitting in the office of this sort of uh, Wolf of Wall Street type place. I've discovered Warren Buffett, and I have this feeling I want his life. I don't want my life. And um, what do I do about it? And uh, Tony Robbins teaches this. Monish Pabrai calls it cloning. And I just started doing what I thought Warren Buffett would do as he, if he was in my shoes. And um, literally, I sat and I said, well, I would read my own annual report. So I read the Berkshire Hathaway annual report. And then I saw you know, he had these investments in these various companies. I ordered up those various companies. And you know, it, I, I don't know how to communicate with you this feeling of this canny feeling of somehow, and I'm not a religious guy. I feel like I'm a rational guy. But somehow, I was connecting up to something that was giving me wisdom and leading me in a better direction. So I, 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 and I've since learned more about that. And it's been an incredible force for change in my life. And just going back to that, uh, uh, that first job that I had, I asked myself, if I had not started reading the Lowenstein biography of Warren Buffett, and I, his sort of force field was not influencing me, and I was not thinking, what would Warren Buffett do in my shoes? I don't know where my career would have gone. I don't know where my morality would have gone. I think it, it, may have, it may have ended in a bad place. And the fascinating thing for me as well is that what Warren Buffett would have done in my shoes is he would have gotten up, walked out of the office, and never come back. Instead, it took me 18, well, until I figured out what was going on, it was maybe six months. It took me you know, eight months to a year to actually do that. So I didn't even model Warren Buffett that well. And I still. Um, um, it still improved my life dramatically. And, uh, and so I just find it fascinating that the minute we just start trying to think, well, what would somebody that I deeply admire do, somebody who's way better at this than I am, and even if we do a small fraction of that, and I've done a very, very small fraction of, in terms of investing, uh, of what Warren Buffett has done. He's got much better returns than I have. He's much smarter than I am. But even just a fraction of that success is extraordinarily good. And um, you know, I, I was so, so part of my nervousness in speaking to you is that you guys are dealing with, at least my perception is you're dealing with things that are closer to physical reality. The properties of what you're dealing with and what you're trying to manipulate is in somehow uh, is, is based in, in things that are less changeable. And I think that when you 
somebody like me who ended up going, I was saying earlier that the two universities I attended are not the MITs and the IITs, they're quite sort of politically oriented universities, a world in which things are much more fluid and things change a lot, I feel like those tools are incredibly helpful. They may be less helpful in an, in an environment where actually just solid scientific knowledge is what you need. But if at some point you guys are going out of this environment into another environment, I think those tools are very useful. Um, later, so, I, uh, so part of this book is this launch with Warren Buffett. And uh, so I fell in love with Warren Buffett and then I kind of started disliking him because I started realizing that I couldn't touch what he'd done. And it's like, so it's like I was angry at him in a certain way. And, and, I, and I was uh, nervous to, 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 to meet him at the lunch. And I had this friend, this Indian friend, Monish Pabrai, who I only would have met if I had been started to write thank you notes. It's absolutely clear. And there are many other things like that uh, that have shown up in my life. But um, uh, the benefit to me of meeting Warren Buffett is that it forced me to give up the idea that I could ever be like him. And it freed me up to be myself. And I think that there, in the, in the value investing world, there are a lot of people who really want to be the next Warren Buffett or can't give up on this idea. So there's this interesting thing that these models of behavior are absolutely wonderful until you take it to extreme and then you end up, it, it's, it's not productive. So you still have to be yourself while modeling other people. So how long have I been talking for, Saurabh? So, um, five more minutes. I got some I got some questions. If one of you you take me on a, qu a question on it, I have a worked investment example to show you how I I kind of take some of the insights that I've learned and, and, and use them in my investing life. I'm irrational. I'm not Warren Buffett. I'm not as smart as Warren Buffett. The world is path dependent. We can't optimize. What do we do about that? And I'll just give you so. Another thing that I've learned about sort of trying to drive myself towards success is rather than trying to fixate on some goal that may or may not be attainable is an idea that I don't know any other way to express it of finding ways to consistently tilt the playing field just a little bit in my direction because I think it's so hard to at least in the world where I exist to say, I'm going to go and buy an insurance company, or I'm going to go and build the next Berkshire Hathaway, or I'm going to go and have the best investment returns, I'm going to find the cheapest company. All of those things are really hard to do, but um, finding rules that tilt the playing field are a lot, a lot easier. And literally, I don't think I've tilted the playing field by very much, but tilting the playing field by a little bit got me in front of you, which is pretty, I really do think it's pretty extraordinary and an amazing testament to the power of that. So, and so the thank you notes is one way of tilting the playing field. Sending out thank you notes, creating goodwill, leaving a little bit more on the table in every interaction that I have leaves people with a positive impression of me willing to help or willing to do something. And that comes in in unexpected times. But now I'm going to go to some very specifics. And so this comes down to you know, investing, just straight some, some of the things that I, I write about. But, um, and I'll just talk to some of them. And uh, so, and so these are directed, I sort of, uh, so, uh, investors would be sort of looking at these and saying half of these are heresies. And I don't want to discuss all of them, but um, so, uh, I want to pick one that I can't even see there because there are more rules than there are up there. But um, you know that that second one is such a powerful thing <laughs> and so easy to implement, and in, it resulted in such an increase in my quality of life. So I'm in New York and I'm running sort of like about fifty million dollars, and I get into some databases, and now all manner of brokers and other people are calling me up, and the phone's ringing off the hook. And for some time, that feels really good because I, I need to feel significant. And now these people are paying attention to me. And um, you know, so they all have an ax to grind. They all have a commission to make. They all have something that, it, that skews the environment, puts me into their sales force field. And I would tell you that um, you cannot believe how many people still operate by choosing whatever is most available because a salesperson calls them up. 
The minute I figured out this rule, and this is like if you think of ants solving complex problems about where to build their nests and where to find food sources and where to direct their energies by a very simple set of rules that Hull Doubler and Wilson have identified, I think that is one straight simple rule. So, you know, I started doing it. People would call up and say, oh, this is a sales call. I'm really sorry, but I will not be able to buy your product because you're selling it to me. And then, <laughs> you know, be like, but how are you going to find out about new phone servers? Or how are you going to find out about great tech stocks? And I'd say, well, I'd ask one of my peers, I'm, and this is like before the internet's really taken off, I'd ask one of my peers, I'm not going to ask you. So the phone stops ringing instantly. And I just created a whole area of sort of quiet calm where there used to be um, sort of noise. And so just simply, and, and it's an interesting thing that that doesn't direct me to success, but it just creates one condition. I think that doing that consistently tilts the playing field a little bit. Just to go specific into sort of like the investment world, a friend of mine calls me, so no, a deal guy is in Zurich and he wants to talk to me about a deal. So he calls me up and he says, hey, we've got something that's very interesting. Can I come by to the office and talk about it? And the answer is, no, thank you very much. Send me a PDF. No, but I'm in Zurich today, and it's timely, and I really want to talk to you about it. So then the answer goes like this. It says, look, you can come to the office and talk to me about it, but then I won't be able to invest in it, because that's my rule. And um, <laughs> you know, so now he's stuck, because, because he really wants me to invest in it. But the simple, thing, the simple rule of saying, I'm not going to take a sales call. Send me the information in written form so that I can evaluate in a non sort of like salesy heightened environment where my mind is going to be messed with is just a better way to do things. Warren Buffett says he doesn't participate in open outcry auctions. It's exactly the same idea. And people come to him and they say, they say, you know, but this is the most amazing deal. And yes, it's an auction. And he's just saying that he's saying over a lifetime of making those kinds of decisions, if he doesn't show up at any open outcry auction or when any, anything is being auctioned, he's going to do better. So it's a strange thing because it's not, it's not saying, well, I'm shooting at that target. I'm saying, well, if I just get enough things away from that target, eventually something will hit it. It's a sort of a, a backward way of, of creating, I guess it's just the creating the dish conditions for success. And if you ask me about it, I'll come back to this. But um, you know, uh, TED Talks are uh, 18 minutes. So I've already gone over my TED Talk time by, you know, um, and uh, so I title this chapter, so those rules, those kind of heuristics accepting that I'm, uh, uh, my limitations, I think are powerful for investing. I think that a lot of people who invest and who sell their investments, they want to try and convince you that they're doing it all in a certain way. And I think that most of them are using some kind of heuristics, but they just don't want to talk about it. And I think that the industry that I'm in should be more honest with the people who are not in the industry about what they're actually doing. And many people want to hear, oh, well, we optimize, you know, we review the portfolio once a month, and when a stock comes to 80% of its intrinsic value, then we sell it. And I just think that that is so out of sync for everything we know about what humans are. Why is the financial industry not talking more honestly about it? I decided that I would rather talk honestly about what I do and that I'm trying to manage my irrationality than um, than kind of, and I, when I started doing the book, I definitely had the agenda item, I'd like to drum up business. And I was lucky enough to have been around some great people that, and, and I'd read the um, autobiography of Mahatma Gandhi where he talks about, within the first third of the book, about going with prostitutes. So here's a guy writing his autobiography. He's a leading man of India. He's revered as a saint, and he wants to tell the world that he slept with prostitutes. And I thought, well, if he can be that honest, um, uh, maybe I should be honest too. And, but I started off the project hoping to drum up business, or at least having that as somewhere as an agenda item. And I was lucky enough to realize that it was more valuable for me, and I, I, I would live a more meaningful life if I was authentic and honest than if I kind of uh, tried to sort of cover up some things that I didn't like. But so I think there is a lot of stuff that gets told by the financial industry to the American public, which is just sales talk, because it's what they expect to hear. And I think that the financial industry, especially having failed the United States and the world in 2008-9, with a lot of rich people in it, 
has an obligation to be more honest about what's going on. I don't think it's that hard to do. We just got to get more people doing it. But, um, but what really blew me away about, so the thank you notes led me to this guy, Monish Pabrai, and I started studying how um, he lived. And I just feel like this technology of success in life that I feel like I've uncovered is more valuable than anything that I learned about investing. And I'll just romp through a few of those really quickly. Um, so some more kind of heuristic rules like the ants. So I used to try and sell to people at cocktail parties. And I figured out a very, it's again, it's like the don't take sales calls. It's like meet somebody, do something for them, see how they respond. And there's, there's basically, I mean, I guess the give and take book does it very well by Adam Grant. But there, is the, there are the takers, the matches, and the givers. And you do so, I do something for someone. You figure out very quickly whether they're uh, takers or matches. Takers or matches, we want to de-emphasize in our lives. Givers, we want to spend all the time we possibly can around givers. And there's an example of, you know, at first, when you start giving like that, you get all the takers. They, get drawn to, they got drawn to me. And so there's a lot of sorting that goes on and a lot of ways in which you have to get them out of your life. But then over, over time, and I'm talking about five or 10 years, I suddenly find myself surrounded by people who give all around me. And that sets the conditions for success. And so here's something else that I think is, I, I get really excited about this. So all of the stuff that I did, ha having uncovered these ideas, are ideas that I could have never justified to any marketing department, because it looks like totally wasted money. And um, so we have this, it's an incredible opportunity for any individual or anybody who controls their lives, that we have this incredible bias in the world towards activity that you can show a return in a relatively short period of time, because no manager of any business or any marketing department is going to be able to stick around if he's investing, in, unless it's a very unusual business. If, if he's doing investments, they're going to take, you know, he says, well, it may never pay off, but it might take 10 years. And I feel like many of the activities that I've done are things that I started with no payoff. And then we have this sort of like very, very, a slope that is a little bit better than what it would have been. And it's imperceptible. And we think in linear terms. And most people just discard it. And if you're willing to just keep doing those things for like 10 years, then suddenly that, that slope, because it's, 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 it's growth, it's not linear, is pulling away from the slope that it would have been on. And when people start noticing it, it's 10 years out, and then they misattribute. So these, that's one simple idea of sort of getting a slightly better crowd of people around us. Um, you know, I mean, Brene Brown has talked about being vulnerable. I never understood that empathizing to people is a business tool. And time and again, I've realized that just uh, rather than just, I mean, it happened to me the other day. So I met a journalist uh, who writes for the Huffington Post called Dory Clark. I showed up, and all I wanted to do was talk about my book. And instead, I had, from some miraculous divine inspiration, I held back. And I actually, even though it was set up in such a way that what I had to do was download uh, to her, here's what you need to write about my book for the Huffington Post, or, or Forbes, or a couple of other publications, I held back, and I just said, tell me who you are. I spent, we, you know, we spent um, half an hour talking about two books that she's written that I hadn't had the wherewithal to read up upon, which I should have done. And she realized she had somebody who was actually interested in her. And it wouldn't necessarily have happened in all cases, but um, uh, she ended up inviting me to an author dinner. And I found a friend. And that was a much better relationship. And there's something that can grow out of that. There's optionality that can come out of that. I never understood that uh, that idea of empathy is actually a great business tool. And I think that if you're wrong environment, it definitely is not going to work. If you're around givers, it definitely will work. And um, the same with being vulnerable. When I sat at my, stood at my partnership meeting, they said, how do you sell? What is your sales, uh, uh, what was it? What is your process for selling stocks? And I, say, I said in front of my partners, I said, I actually have a very bad process. I don't know how to do it well. I don't believe anybody does it well. Uh, in this world, people are drawn to that. And over time, that accumulates. So um, you know, we can get back to it if you like. They're up there. So, uh, um, and I, I touched on this, and I'm going to close on this. So, and I'll, I'll just give I'll give one example. So, 
there are investors who are more successful than I am. And I've seen investors who, so the classic thing is there's a conference called the Value Investing Congress. And some very, very persuasive and unbelievably smart people present there. So there's a couple of people who are big stars there, a guy called Bill Ackman and a guy called David Einhorn. And if any of us were to sit in a presentation with Bill Ackman and David Einhorn, uh, we'd run out and buy whatever stock they're talking about and or sell short whatever stock they're talking about selling short. And sometimes they work out and sometimes they don't. But this idea that, that um, you know, this, uh, what we do in the world has got to resonate for us internally. And what I realized, and just I'll just share this. Um, so I, I have this relationship with Monish Pabrai, and people think that I say intelligent things to him. I don't. <laughs> I think that what's going on there is, or part of what's going on is that um, he is naturally, because of the way his mind works, less averse to loss. And I have this family history where my family was, uh, ancestors of mine were kicked out of Germany in, in the 30s. And I think that that ricochets down the generations and I have a mortal fear of loss. And um, uh, so I think that it's beneficial for Monish Pabrai to talk to somebody about the investing world who has a mortal fear of loss because it's, he can sort of, he can read something into the situation that he couldn't read himself. I think that I responded better to the financial crisis by not denying that history of mine, but just, again, being honest about it, knowing that that was part of who I am, and then acting um, synchronous with that, or acting, acting in, uh, in concert with that idea. And I just, I guess, the simple idea is that whenever I've looked for answers outside of myself, I haven't found very good answers. And the, the minute I looked for answers inside myself, the world changed. And here's a better example. It's, it was really hard for me to admit to myself that classmates of mine, Bill Ackman's from the year above me, and another guy who's famous for being a, a very successful hedge fund manager, this guy, Chris Hahn. It was very hard for me to admit to myself that I was envious of them. And, but for as long as I didn't admit I was envious of them, I kept trying to live this life in New York City of being a big, successful hedge fund manager. The minute I took the pain and was willing to say, no, you're just envious of them, and you should stop being envious of people. Envy, all emotions are a call, call to action. The emotion of envy is, is a sign that there isn't something right in your life. And the minute I redirected that energy, and like we're talking wasting large amounts of money, renting big fancy offices with glass, with, 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 with wall to ceiling glass and trading room and um, uh, analysts and COO, I mean, that, that costs a lot of money, all because I was unable to admit to myself that I, was, I had envy for something that I shouldn't have envy for. And the minute I redirected that and said, well, how would I reset up my life given that I, I either I'm not able to or I'm not successfully getting to where these people are, I found answers. And the answers were stop living that kind of life and live a life that's more in sync. So um, the inner journey is a great business tool. And with that, I'm going to stop and take questions. If somebody asks me to go through investment idea, just to give a sense, I will, but only if you ask me. So the floor is yours. The question was, um, how do I decide how much cash to have in my portfolio or other kind of high level decisions like that? And so I think that that is a classic example of false optimization. It's a classic example of trying to find the answer to something that doesn't exist. And um, it's a waste of brain cells in a certain way. So another idea, a, idea that I didn't touch on is uh, this guy, Gerd Gigenreiter, says, so the wonderful experiment is you take children, you put them in a room, and then they have to take an exam. So in one control group, you put them in a room, there's nothing on the table, they wait for five minutes, they go take the exam. In the other room, there's chocolates on the table. You say to the children, don't eat the chocolates. You can't eat the chocolates, now go take the exam. And the children comply, they don't eat the chocolates, but they perform much worse on the exam. And the idea is, is that there is, the brain has a certain amount of willpower, there's a limited amount every day. And, um, and literally, just preventing themselves from eating the chocolates 
is using up that willpower and it reduces their ability to concentrate in the exam. And that's why anything important that we want to do in life, uh, you know, like I've figured out that the only time for me to work out is first thing in the morning. It's the only time that I have the willpower to do it. Even if I wait an hour or two, we're done. And so we really want to conserve our willpower for things that count. And I think that following the stock tickers, having a screen open, which is constantly, you know, so we know that reading is more stressful if you're on a, if you're on a web screen because your brain is constantly trying to decide whether to click on a link or not. And if you have a, and, and that literally uses up, it uses up brain energy. And if you have a, 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 just a page, that, that all of that question mark goes away so we can, we can focus on the page. So it's all about conserving energy for the things that count. And so if you're coming from my perspective and I really can't predict where the market will go in the short run, um, and I don't even know, you know, I can't even be, be certain that the companies that I'm investing in, I can't be 100% knowledgeable that I know enough about them um, to make the investment. What I'm trying to do, like an ant colony, is to create habits and behaviors that improve the probability that I will outperform the market. And that comes down to, in the, in, in the case of cash for me, I'm not trying to manage the amount of cash. If I see something that makes a huge amount of sense, I'm doing it. Uh, and if I, see, if I don't see something that makes a huge amount of sense, I let the cash build up. In the same way, I'm not trying to sell investments when they get to, um, probably if they get ridiculously overvalued, I, I would like to believe that I would sell them. But so, you know, one of my investors asks me, do you sell, you know, do you sell at, uh, you know, if the value is 100, do you sell at 50, 60, at 100, 120? And I kind of tried to explain that it's not like I know the value is 100. I kind of know that it's probably undervalued at 50, and it's probably overvalued at 200. You know, and in the middle of that range, that's the kind of uncertainty that I'm dealing with. In the middle of that range, what I'm trying to do is uh, minimize transaction costs, because we know that transaction costs are really important. I don't know if that's helpful, but. Uh, in your eight rules, I was curious, number six was never trade when the market is open. I was just curious why that's one of so, the rules. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, so one of the rules is never trade when the market is open. If it said never, then I should correct it, because what I should say is try not to trade when the market is open, because I think there are, you know, there are, in the real world, there are always exceptions that you want it. So I try to leave myself the freedom to break those rules. but. Um, the, you know, so, so uh, who, uh, you know, trade station, you know, um, you get your monitor, you get your access, you can trade at any time, you can react to prices. I mean, it gives this completely false impression, at least of what I'm trying to do. And I think that it, it's, it's selling people a false hope. I think that the traders that make money, somebody I know was a chief, he recently left his job, but he was a chief currency trader for Goldman Sachs, uh, for uh, Citigroup. Citigroup gets huge flows, and they work hard on getting those flows. They are not making money because they have any, any they're making money because they can charge a bid-ask spread, and because they have temporary knowledge of a huge order that's just come in, that they can, that they can sort of like price away from the market a little bit, and then they can resell it to somebody else. So maybe if you're a, a chief currency trader at uh, Citigroup, um, uh, that trading idea works, or that, that approach to the markets work. But I think in the vast majority of circumstances, I mean, I'm trying to buy something today that will, um, that will go up ideally 3x over three years or 4x, so it's like very, very large movements in price. And I am blown away by the number of times that I, who, who at the time thought he was rational, I now know better, would be dissuaded by the price movement on the day. So you know, uh, the, thing, the thing is priced at 10, and we know in retrospect that it was going to go to 50, and I didn't buy it because it was trading up by two, you know, by, by, by two basis points or something. And that really impacts you, and it's crazy. And so there's a, I found that it's just simpler. And it's, it's, it's actually, uh, it's, it's not I found. I learned it directly from Monish Pabrai. He showed me the rule, and it was obvious to me the minute he said it. Just don't, don't, don't allow yourself to trade when the market's open. Decide the night before what you're going to do. 
and then put the trade in, decide. I mean, that, that doesn't mean you shouldn't put limit orders in or find some way to make sure that, uh, but, but think about it in a, in a quiet environment and then, and then allow it to happen. And, um, but. Great, thanks. Hi, um, so here at Google, there is a strong community of uh, people who believe in passive uh, investing um, indexes. And so you said on several occasions, uh, don't optimize, don't optimize. So uh, I wonder, like, why not just um, do that, like uh, invest in the S&P index? I, well? I think it's a great idea. And, you know, John Bogle is, is, a, is a, oh. <laughs> um, so the question is, why not just? That mic was working, so you don't have to repeat. I actually have a follow-up to this as well. Um, so um, yesterday, so I believe you actually your fund, Aquamarine Fund, is, is beating the S&P index um, since um, the beginning. Um, um, but yesterday, somebody showed me some interesting data that was um, some um, funds that are supposed to be value investing funds, such as let's say the Sequoia Fund and the Tweedy Brainy, um, and not that, but even like Warren Buffett and Berkshire. I think they are actually lagging behind the S&P index. And just out of probability, there is always going to be someone who is going to beat the index, right? So I guess I wonder, like, how do you know that you're not that random person <laughs> that yeah. is bound to happen? And how do you know you're <laughs> how, how do you know you're going to keep actually? It, it seems like a lot, awful lot of effort to do what you're doing, and in the end, do you know that you're going to be above the index after 10 years from now? <laughs> This, this. So I, I could answer that very easily and just say no. <laughs> but um, I, look, indexing is a great idea. The index is a really hard uh, um, sort of opponent to beat because it doesn't pay transaction costs. I would say that if you do the index, and you know, John Bogle is a really known well guy, and there's Vanguard indexes, and they've they've done a service to investors. And I was telling somebody over lunch today that to sort of say. To look at the index as a baseline is a great place to start. But what I would say is that if you're going to index, pick, pick the right index. So if you take the S&P during uh, the, uh, the financial bubble of 2009, uh, it was very skew skewed by some very overvalued companies. And there was this sort of market cap weighted index. So the more these companies became overvalued, uh, the more they had to be in the index. And so you were kind of investing in an index that was skewed towards the opposite of value investing, going into the biggest companies. So I would want to pick an index that doesn't have those SKUs in it, like the Dow Jones index doesn't have those SKUs. So I'd want to spend a little bit of time, and probably everybody in this room is capable, to, to understand how the index is constructed, to know that it's the right index to use. So there's absolutely no question that that's a smart way to do things. And it's a good baseline for even people who are doing other things. So you know, to the second part of your question, how do I, you know, we all know that Nassim, it's from Nassim Taleb's book, but you take a, you take a bunch of individuals, a thousand individuals, have them all flip coins, you know, and probabilistically after a number of rounds as somebody who's just flipped head, heads all the way through, and then you interview them, and they really did believe that they really believe that, I, oh, I knew it, I knew it. They feel like they have a lucky hand. I mean, you know, it's really powerful stuff. And, uh, you know, so, um, I don't know. <laughs> I have to say that. I don't know. And um, uh, so there's this amazing article written by um, Warren Buffett called The Super Investors of Graham's and Doddsville. I highly recommend it. I'm sure it's on the internet. I'm sure it's sitting in your servers in multiple places, but uh, <laughs> replicated across the world. But, but he tried to answer that question. And he just said, look, what if? You know, the monkeys flipping coins all studied at Columbia Business School under this guy called Ben Graham, and they all talk about buying things at a discount to intrinsic value. Then at some point, you might have to ask whether um, uh, this is not just flipping coins. And so I think that the probability right now that Berkshire Hathaway, fourth or fifth largest company by market cap in the United States, is a fluke, is, is getting pretty low. So clearly, there are some ways that some people can act in the world to, um, to beat those indices, which are incredibly hard to beat. I'd very much like to be one of those people. And I have some huge handicaps, because I'm not as smart as Warren Buffett, and I don't live in Omaha. I think that I'm much better off today, because I figure out those weaknesses, and I'm working, I'm working to, um, to uh, um, 
compensate for them the way I think Warren Buffett naturally did. So I actually think that Warren Buffett, everything that I'm talking about, I'm excited because I feel like I've uncovered some really valuable things that the world isn't talking about. Uh, I think Warren Buffett understands them. He just has, he gets more fun out of investing than talk, talking about these things. But, and if you go to the Berkshire meeting, and I invite you all to join me at the south door of the uh, Omaha Convention Center at 5.30 a.m. on the Saturday morning of the Berkshire meeting, I'll be there. A guy called Alex Bosert will be there. Monish Pabrai will be there. A whole bunch of other people. And it's a great example of just get around people who are better than you, and you can only improve. Um, but they say every year that if for a long enough period of time they don't outperform the indices, then you know, then there's questions that have to be raised. And you know, I think that they've they've hit a five-year period where they didn't outperform, but then they started outperforming again. And I think that all of their shareholders would not have wanted to remove the management and have somebody else run it. And it's a question that uh, it's something that I tell my shareholders every time. So. Hi, yeah. Have you, um, you're in the value investing space, have you thought about how to apply your investing philosophy in a growth, venture capital, new emerging technologies um, type of investment? You know, uh, so people of my ilk, I think, often have sort of tech envy. And um, we would love to invest in uh, businesses that are in growth mode. and. So if I, if I think about, so I'll give you an example of why it's so hard. I had an investment in a company called ITG, Investment Technology Group. So ITG, in, a, in an age where the internet was just getting going, had, had, had created a stock crossing network that enabled people to sort of put their, it was well before these, uh, the sort of like all the stuff that Flash Boys talked about. Uh, but it enabled people to put their the stocks that they couldn't trade, very large institutions, that huge volumes that they wanted to put in the market, into a blind pool where um, if, if two people matched opposite sides of the trade, it worked. And, uh, and you got a match, and then, they, and then ITG would take a commission. They had spent 15 years building up what was called Posit. I think it still exists. Um, they'd spent 15 years building it up. And it looked beautiful, and I felt like I discovered a sort of like a, a kind of a Costco, the low cost operator, the thing that offers the clients the best value for money in the financial markets. And then at the time, I don't remember the name of the network, but something came up within three months and achieved the same volumes. And then within a year or two later, there were dozens of competitors. And ITG is still around, but, but the beautiful growth prospects that existed just weren't there. So I think that what is so hard, and I've tripped up on, on this on a number of occasions, is that you're buying the future, and the future is not certain, and you'd like to believe that the company that you've invested in, or I'd like to believe that the company that I've invested in is going to be the winner, but it's just so hard to do. That said, a very famous value investor, Bill Miller, at the time that AOL was like the dominant uh, internet company, made a huge amount of money. Uh, you know, this was a time when AOL was marketing their service, their internet service, by sending direct mail out with these CDs that, can you remember? Yeah, we don't even have CD drives anymore in our, in our computers. But um, he'd figured something out. But then he lost uh, a huge amount of money in the tech crisis. And there are some value investors today. There's a guy that I respect an awful lot who, has, who, who had a very large position in um, Amazon. And so I, I get envious because I look at it and he made four times his money so far. And I believe me, there are plenty of my investments that have not made four times my money. And you know, I understood, after talking to him for a couple of days, I understood a lot more about Amazon than I did. But I just found, I've discovered that in my case, by in doing that, I get it wrong more often than I get it right. So I think it's really hard. And there's a, a, an idea written up where buying the future is not a great thing to do because it often doesn't turn out that way. So I don't think it actually works very well. And I have a certain amount of angst because I think that what everybody in this room is doing is creating a better world for us. And what actually am I doing? I'm helping, I'm helping some rich people get richer. And maybe I'm <laughs> allocating some capital. But I, I think that what, what's going on here is actually a lot more meaningful. And I think that especially visiting the Google campus, um, 
I think that in a different version of my life, I would have stayed studying mathematics and physics and maybe gone to an MIT and ended up. And so I'll, I'll leave you with this idea in case all of you, you know, the grass on the other side of the, of the road is always greener. So um, I, was a, <laughs> I was a classmate of Mark Pincus. So uh, I got to know him. He was in a sec my section at Harvard Business School. Uh, he taught me a lot about playing chess. He was a game player then. He just loved games. That's what he loved to do. And I think actually Mark Pincus is a great example with Zinger of how when you're in a world, your love of games is aligned with the outer world. Extraordinary things can happen. Uh, and then when you, you realize that your outer world is all about management and that's not what your inner world is about, you need to leave and you need to do something else. But um, he, so I visited him in San Francisco uh, re a few years after business school. And I've, I've fallen in love with Warren Buffett, and I'm doing value investing. And uh, he just looks at me and says, look, Guy, you could make large amounts of money. But at the end of the world, who cares? I'm here changing the world. And I think he's got a really good point. And, and uh, so I have a certain amount of angst about it. But I'm not going to change what I do now, because I'm enjoying my life. So The talk you gave today reminds me, like uh, Warren Buffett talked about the inner score uh, System. I think that was all you talk about uh, today, right? Yeah. It's like, um, can you uh, tell me a little bit more about it? Like, like uh, how do like, uh, for the fun you mentioned about envy, right? Uh, Warren Buffett also said that it's not greedy, but it's envy who like uh, that will destroy the world, right? Yeah. yeah. Could you tell me like? Uh, how can you not envy people? Because for example, like uh, I, some of my friend was working in like. Uh, was uh, he was working at a company which was bought by Facebook, so he earned a lot. So obviously, <laughs> we were got envy. So could you please, like, yeah. So you know, I, I you. asked Warren Buffett that question, and, and so I said it to him like this, and I, I wasn't I wasn't ready to admit to the extent of my envy for certain people. So I said I put it to him like this, and the the answer will scare you. I said, okay. So by this time, he's convinced me to call him Warren. Early on, I'm saying Mr. Buffett, and he's stopping. So I say, so Warren. I want to put you in these shoes. I'm a manager of yours, and I come to you, and, and I'm a manager of a substantial business of yours, and you rely on my performance uh, for uh, the success of Berkshire Hathaway, and I come to you with a confession, and I say, I'm deeply envious of a peer in my industry, and it's just eating me up, and you know, I know that it's going to force me to get me to make decisions that are not good for the business, but what do I do with this envy? You know, I'm hoping for pearls of wisdom to fall from heaven. And I say, so what would you say to him? He's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know but, um, uh, and I don't know where I, I, I got this from. He did talk to us about this inner scorecard idea at the launch extensively. And just so that you know it, uh, for those of you who don't want to buy the book, which I totally understand, he says, <laughs> uh, there are many books out there. Um, he says, would you rather be considered by the world to be the best lover in the world, but between you and your wife to know that you really suck? <laughs> or would you rather for the world to think that you're pretty bad at being a lover, but for you and your wife to know that you're the very best? And obviously, that was a distinction that I had not really fully understood and made. And, and it was really hard for me, because I realized how much of my life I'd lived by an external scorecard. And I realized in writing the book how much of the environment that we all operate in is so you know exam results, uh, uh, you know all sorts of evaluations. Those are all in a certain way, in many cases, external scorecard. And I was telling Saurabh that my children are in a Montessori Montessori school right now. I think maybe one of the big things that the Montessori school system does is it teaches you an inner scorecard. It teaches you to focus on the things that give you true joy. But I'll tell you what really does deal with envy, and this works, is that so. A really powerful idea, emotions are a call to action. So anger is, a, is an indication that uh, your boundaries have been violated. So you need to protect your boundaries, for example. Um, uh, being sad and, and being in pain means that you need to seek nurture and security. Envy is a signal. So the misdirection of envy is, um, you know, I hate that guy. I want his life, and I don't have it. And so that's envy. Uh, and I don't know why it's associated with the color green. The call to action is, there's something wrong in my life that I need to change. And I promise you, example, you know, the morning uh, I 
woke up next to my wife, totally in love with her, having had an extraordinary night. I was not envious of anyone. My life was really good. The days that I've spent on a windsurfer, yeah, just surfing those waves with the blue sky and strong wind, I was not envious of anyone. You could give me Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, Steven Spielberg, you name it. You know, when you're in those moments, you're not envious. So I think that what I came away from that lunch was a in increased recognition of my own envy and increased recognition of uh, how much my life was on an external scorecard and the absolute desire to change it. And for me, that meant leaving New York. I realized that New York wasn't a healthy place for me. So I think there is a way to deal with envy. It's fixing what, fixing, ensuring that we go to bed every night happy with what we did during the day. And if we're not doing that, then we need to try really hard to get to a place where we're doing that. And once we're doing that, we won't have any envy. So thank you all for coming. I hope I... <laughs> I, hope I <laughs>